Hello and welcome to episode 47 of Crucible Bootcamp. I'm your host, King Koala, and today we're going to be looking at a Rumble submission by a user by the name of Rudolfric. And Rudolfric is playing a Stormcaller, and he's using Hand Cannon Shoddy. And uh, this Rumble match happens to take place on Floating Gardens, which is a rather complicated Rumble map when you compare it to other maps like Burning Shrine or Asylum. Um, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So today we're going to be covering just a handful of topics. The first major one we're going to talk about is uh, how to deal with getting baited, uh, specifically by uh, Shock and Titans, but we'll go into some more broad examples later on. Um, the other things that we're going to talk about are um, having the right weapon out for the right engagement space that you get into based on how you move and also a little tidbits on how to practice patience and what that actually looks like in a game. I'm on okay, so. Floating Gardens is just one of those maps. It's really weird because the spawns tend to take place on very long... Um, they're, they're very far away from each other. So it's really difficult to really lock down one particular area of Floating Gardens because... Uh, as soon as uh, the player pool in that area dries up, you have to actually move all the way to a new area in order to get into another engagement. So this is one of those maps where you can't really effectively control a zone. You have to, uh, yeah, you have to constantly be moving around the map, um, going from zone to zone, and that can tend to put you in situations where you start getting surrounded. So. Uh, people that struggle with floating gardens probably struggle during that transition period between when no one is around and when they need to go find someone because you're going to end up getting shot in the back if you don't move very carefully around the map. So it's important to note that even though he's running a shotgun, we're going to see uh, Rudolfric utilize a lot of space to get in these engagements and make them mostly primary engagements. Um, this is kind of the this is the kind of play that you want to emulate. Um, if you're really focused on KD or you're really focused on winning a match, then you don't necessarily need to be a warrior to win a match. You can just focus a lot on your primary game if you're just very careful about your spacing. So here on radar, we see that there's someone in that 8 to 23 meter range, which is perfect for a hand cannon. That's kind of the sweet spot for hand cannons is when they're in this range on your radar. So, and he just has a nice cleanup kill. Now, I see a lot. I would see a lot of players uh, make a mistake where they pull out their shock in there because their target isn't paying attention to them, and they see a, a fast, uh, an opportunity to just kind of rush that person because they're not paying attention. They have their back to you. That's a big risk, especially if you're pushing into another shotgunner, which is very common in Rumble. Uh, most everyone runs either a shotgun or a fusion. And depending on the charge rate, they should they might have enough time to turn around and challenge you, beat you, or just trade. And by taking the the time to create that space and to keep that space, right? That he let the person move away from him. He didn't have to push in. He just stood his ground and took that fight to to the player. That's the kind of engagement you want to get into over and over again. So the problem with this map is specifically the bridge area. The bridge area is the best place to go to try to get kills. It's also the worst place to try to hide after you finish an engagement. So you tend to want to use the very center of the bridge, kind of what's right in front of Rudolfric right now. You want to use that as primarily an area to move through. You don't want to get caught in an engagement in that particular area. You want to get caught in an engagement where he is now, which is on the stairs, or in that inner circle where the heavy spawns on elimination, where this, uh, um, this statue is currently. So, again, he is, his opponent pushes right into him in this instance. We'll watch that again. This is one of those instances, and this is also why it's so hard to control this bridge, because this player that comes off to his left, if he was any further up, as this player challenges the bridge, he would die immediately. But as you can see, he's backpedaling as he's firing. He's not holding his ground this time because he knows he's getting pushed by someone with a shotgun. 
So he's just slowly backpedaling and tracking his target. He didn't. You didn't have really uh, enough time to um, to get that headshot off on him to get that an optimal kill time. But that's okay. As long as you're just adequately tracking your target and putting shots on, then you're good. Um, there is a point during this engagement, probably. Um, I'll pause it, that you can take out your shotgun and just finish another shotgun. And this is very easy for Warlocks nowadays because they're almost all running Ophidian Aspects. So you have quick draw on all your weapons now. So it's very easy for you to just quick swap to your shotgun and challenge. So he doesn't see anyone, doesn't see one here. After you take one shot and then a second shot, this is where I would probably take my shotgun out. Um, you know the player is still gonna push you and it basically reduces the chance of you um, dying before you finish off your target because your target's very close in this position to being in one shot range. Um, and your advantage is you have full health and you're not in his one shot range and he has half health. And so you could probably finish him with a melee here as well. But again, taking out your shotgun instead is a perfectly viable option. Um, and I would, I would say that it's a less risky option in this particular instance because of how weak your target is. Now, if you missed all your shots initially, then you have to take out your shotgun in order to try to salvage it. And if he hit a headshot initially, then it's you can, uh, you're can you normally safe to try to finish off your target with your primary if you hit that first headshot. By the time he hits that fourth shot on his opponent, um, he could have potentially gotten shotgunned by that, that guy. If he, if the other, his opponent was a little better with his shot. So right now he's trying to bait his target. So this is kind of the opposite version of what's going to happen to him later. And he's trying to actively bait his target. And the way he's doing that is by... Uh, floating straight up into the air he's not floating into his target he's floating up above his target so all right you gotta go because you just can't make up your mind he's uh he's trying to get his target underneath him by using the radar so the radar will tell his target he's either below him or above him now if the his opponent doesn't read his radar very effectively in this situation he could potentially think that he's in this tunnel off to the side by floating straight up in the air because your radar doesn't tell you whether you're above or below, it only tells you that you're on a different elevation by the graying out in the radar. So by using that to your advantage, you could potentially pull your target around into you. So instead, his target doesn't take the bait, so he uses a head glitch here really well on the stairs to get three quick headshots on his, on his opponent. So right now, He's just trying to move between those those spawn zones. And you can see someone spawned behind him, so he could potentially just rotate back and try to challenge. And here, again, the way you bait players with shotguns is floating above doorways as a warlock. It's very, very difficult to push warlocks, um, especially storm warlocks that have a shotgun, because uh, they could just float over the door like this, and they don't need to be in one shot range to kill you. They just need to get you to half health to finish you with this melee. So it's if you ever get a warlock that you know is a storm and you know that they're running a shotgun, absolute, you cannot chase them through doorways. You have to let them go. Um, and that's for not only because they can just bait you through by floating above that door, but the fact that most storm warlocks run... Um, close to, if not max, recovery, means that by the time you do finally engage them, they're most likely going to be back at full health because of how fast they get their health back. So this is one of those instances where he didn't have time to get that primary shot off, right? And you can see he's already pushing him. And this is one of those snap decisions if you're a shotgunner that you have to get good at making. If you see players that are pushing you, especially if they've just jumped straight up into the air at you and you know what their tra trajectory is, you know exactly where they're going to be. Even if this guy was running bones, you know he's still going to probably just drop down on top of you. This is a perfect opportunity for you to just whip out that shotgun like he does and finish off. And he follows up melees. This is something that you have to get used to as a shotgunner. You need to build the muscle memory that you're always follow up meleeing 
after your shot. It's a it's especially important for storm callers because uh, your shotgun is not going to kill in the same range that your melee hits. Your melee is longer than your one hit shotgun range, so you want to take advantage of that. You want to shoot at that melee range and then follow up melee and kill them before they get into an actual shotgun melee range, uh, uh, an actual shotgun one shot range. And that's a huge advantage that you have as a Stormcaller over every other class that um, that runs a shotgun. Is you can if you can utilize negative space really well, and you can utilize backpedaling and floats and things like that, and combine that into your gameplay, you basically become the best form of shotgunner in the current iteration of the game. That's a defensive shotgunner. You let players push to you. You let players go through chokes. You let players do a lot of the work. Um, and you and when you go on the offensive, you always have the ability to just uh, cut off that engagement whenever you want because you have a, a, the, the melee advantage. And once your melee isn't up, then, I mean, you're still a warlock. You still have an extended um, uh, melee range as it is over other classes. You have 6 meters. I believe uh, storm melee goes out to 10 or 11 meters, depending on where it tracks. Um, and here... Same, kind of same thing. He has the right idea in this particular engagement where he gets one shot off, his target's still pushing him, he gets off his shotgun, and then he uh, he shotguns him. But in this instance, unlike the first uh, engagement he got into, he didn't follow up melee. If he follow up melee there, he likely would have traded with his target. Um, potentially, if you're really if you're hyper aware of your target's health, then um, you can even... He could have just sniped him out of the sky with his melee. Because I believe he was low. A little low. Oh, not quite. So he was within melee or melee damage after that, that shotgun shot that he kind of whiffed, like whiffed a few pellets. But um, if he had gotten two, shot, two body shots off on that target, then his melee is going to kill. Because that's uh, two 50, 57s. Um, or 54s, and then the 122 to the body with your melee. So you can see that even off spawn, this, keep in mind that this is still rumble, and if we're trying to win, we're trying to get into as many uh, engagements as possible. So you don't want to spend a lot of time waiting around. So, But I want to point out that um, there's a difference between waiting for someone to show up and locking down an area of the map that you know someone will show up in. So the difference is um, where you're located on the map, really. If you're in your spawn or you're in a sniper lane and it's easily avoidable, it's easy to know which lanes are sniper lanes or what, whatnot as players, especially if you've been playing this game for a long time. Um, and because they're easy to avoid, when you go to that sniper lane, you're basically putting yourself in a position where you put all, um, you put the entire game in your opponent's hands. You don't have any say over when your opponent shows up. You don't have any say over um, if anyone's going to show up, period. So you just sit there passively and you wait for someone to show up and then you take a reactionary shot. That's not how you want to play the game because it doesn't further you uh, in the game to get to that end goal of, of winning. You have to be proactive about getting into your engagements. So patient play involves you moving off wherever you are and going to where you know players will go to. It's not a place that they'll avoid, but you know they'll travel through it, and normally that's in the center of the map. So if you set up angles around the center of the map, on any map, in any game mode, if you set up angles around the center of the map, that's when you want to play patiently. Those are times that you want to wait for your opponent to make a mistake, Get, let them be impatient, let them push out into the open, and you take your your uh, your angle advantage and you just get shots off for free. You fire that first shot off and you have that fraction of a second advantage over your opponent. And, uh, I mean, I say this all the time, but the golden rule in first-person shooters is he who fires first should win the engagement. Like, if you fire first and you lose the engagement, that's on you, right? Your gun skill wasn't good enough. Um... You know, maybe they dip back into cover. Maybe you had really poor positioning. Um, all, all these things, it's all on you as a player. If you fire first and you hit that first shot, like, you're golden. You should win that engagement because you have a huge advantage over your opponent. 
and you should be putting yourself in those positions. So playing patiently is about going to this center area, this bridge area, and waiting for people to show up. Now, um, a little thing that I want to point out here that comes up a couple times is that you have to keep in mind on a big map like Floating Gardens, if you run something like uh, if you run something like a hand cannon on these big open maps, you have to be very aware of what angles you can actually lock down and you can actually challenge at. So you saw there, he challenged someone out on, um, on red ramp. And the problem with that is that this is way too far for this hand cannon, as evidenced by the fact that he body shots him, but he hits him for 34. So if we keep in mind that our body shot damage normally is 54. 20 points of damage is huge. Um, so if you want to engage players at these extreme long ranges, you absolutely have to do two things with a hand cannon specifically. The first thing you have to do is you have to hit headshots. You have no option to hit body shots because if they're running something like a pulse rifle or a scout rifle at the same range, you're going to get outgunned every single time. Um, Normally, you're going to get outgunned at this range almost every single time anyway to those weapon types. But if you do have to engage here or you want to engage here, you have to do it in a very specific way. The second thing you need to do if you engage at this range, in addition to hitting headshots, like every shot needs to be a headshot kind of thing. Because every shot needs to be a headshot, and we know that the way hand cannons work, they, are, they have an accuracy cone. And once damage drop-off starts happening, that cone is wider than your target, your reticle. It's not a laser beam anymore. It's, a, it's an area around your target where you can miss. You have to pace your shots because you want that area to be as small as possible. The more you shoot, the bigger that area gets because of bloom. So you start in, uh, introducing all these um, inconsistencies in your shot, not necessarily because of your aim, but because of the game mechanics. And you want to limit that as much as you can. And the way you do that is you pace your shots. So um, that makes this kind of engagement, if you want to get into it, again, very risky. Because you have to pace your shots, which means your time to kill is lower. And you have to hit headshots, which means you have to be hyper accurate in order to get these engagements. So personally, I would say don't engage here. But there are situations that come up. Like this isn't a hard and fast rule. There are situations that come up where... You should be engaging at this at this space because it's maybe the only opportunity you're going to get to to hit this person, or maybe you're team firing and then and putting any shots on that target is going to be better than trying to reposition if the engagement is happening simultaneously with someone else. All right, so. Again, he's playing the patient game. He's letting people come into, you know, where they're, he knows that they're going to start pushing towards. And this is going to be the first instance that he kind of gets radar baited. So someone, as soon as someone shows up in the pie slice on your radar, and I know he's running, what is it, Gellion? So he has like the, the super radar. But as soon as someone shows up in the pie slice, they're at 23 meters. So as soon as they show up, they're in the perfect primary range. The further in you move, the worse it gets for you as a player because you you get further and further into shotgun range or slide shotgun range or potentially, I mean, some people still run blink and you could still get blink shotgun. Maybe they blink behind you. They're, or um, more commonly than not, the 23 meter range, if you can't see your target when you immediately get to, when you when you see that blip on radar, is you can get skated onto by Titan. So here, the Titan just flow right above him and drop right down on top of him. So we'll, we'll watch that in real time. So here, he sees the target. So this point, right before he gets to Inner Circle. So he gets to Inner Circle, he's on target, and he spent so much time searching for his target, despite knowing that uh, because you can't go underneath where he is and the, the target on his radar is, is uh, grayed out a little bit, you know he's above you. And, the long, and, and all it took was two seconds for his target to go from that 23 meter range to 10 meters, right? To that one shot shotgun range or that uh, shock and melee range, which in this case would be four and a half meters. Um, or six, I guess six-ish meters, because you kind of lunge a little bit. 
um, as you're falling. So taking into account like latency and all that stuff, probably about six meters, which is warlock melee range. It's fair. That two seconds is enough time to kill your target, but you have to make that snap decision as soon as you see them show up on radar. If you hesitate at all, that's why you're getting shotgunned as soon as someone shows up on radar like that, because you need to immediately put shots off on your target because of how fast titans move in the air. Now this guy wasn't moving as fast as a normal titan like skating on a on a level plane would be because he floated above and dropped down. But if that titan was on the ground and you saw him, uh, you normally wouldn't have enough time in that space, even if he was going right at you, uh, to kill him unless you hit three perfect shots. You hit a headshot and you hit two body shots and he doesn't have jug up. If this titan that's skating at you at that 23 meter range ever has Juggernaut up, you die. Every single time. Unless the Titan just whiffs his shot, which is, you know, it happens. But if they normally, uh, if they whiff a shot, if they still hit you with a couple pellets, that if they have Storm Fist up, um, that's 156 damage. So they only needed two pellets to kill you. Uh, because of that, it's very easy for titans to trade or just outright kill you even if their aim isn't the greatest so how do you combat this how do you combat this as a player dealing with jug, sh jug shock on titans or dealing with people that bait you on radar well let's go back to what we were talking about earlier with patient play well playing patiently lets you see your target more often um especially when you were crouched so rudolfric crouches a lot which is good you want if you want to play patiently you have to crouch because you want to stay at as much off radar as you possibly can now you, it isn't perfect you're still going to be on radar occasionally um you're still going to blip you know every time you if you crouch and you watch your radar every time it flashes um that center uh blue triangle that's you as a player every time that flashes while you're crouched um you've shown back up on radar and every time it disappears you're back off radar so you can kind of tell when you're on and off radar as you're crouching. Um, the other thing is, because you see your target, if someone is trying to trying to push you like that, especially jug, jug titans, you don't want to backpedal. Backpedaling is the one thing you absolutely do not want to do because, well, two things. Really. You don't want to move into your target, and you don't want to back, just straight backpedal because uh, titans move so fast that... You just backpedaling and breaking a jug shield uh, isn't going to give you enough time to get the follow-up shots to kill them. Um, you can break the jug shield and then potentially, as a warlock with Ophidian, switch to your shotgun and trade or switch to your shotgun and uh, beat them. But it's going to be very difficult. Like The timing window is you have to hit all three shots to break the jug shield. And you have to immediately, as soon as you fire that third shot, without knowing... If it connects or not, you have to immediately switch to your shotgun and then, excuse me, and then you have to shotgun them. That's, that's like the, the sequence of events that has to happen in order for you to kill someone that's just pushing you straight forward with the jug shield in that 23 meter range. Um, and, and like, that's really your only option. So for backpedaling, that's why you don't want to backpedal because that option is very, very high risk, very like low percentage it's probably like a i don't know i'm just gonna pull this out of my butt but it's probably like a 10 percent like play that you're gonna you're gonna win that engagement it's probably 10 percent of the time um that might even be high i don't know uh it feels high to me it's probably to me it's probably more like a like a 595 kind of engagement where five times out of 100 you you, you win and 95 times out of 100 you get bodied uh, instead of backpedaling, though, what you want to do is move laterally, so side to side. The thing, the weakness of Titans uh, is that their skate moves them in a straight line. So it's predictable and you always know where they're going to go. So if you can move laterally fast enough, which means that your reaction time has to be immediate, um, or as close to immediate as possible. As soon as you see someone pushing you, you need to in immediately decide, i got to move out of the way. Um, think of it like you're standing, like the line from, from your Juggernaut Titan to you is train tracks. And that Titan is a train. You need to get out of the way of the train so the train can pass by you and you can stay safe, right? You don't get run over by the train. No one likes getting run over by a train. You normally don't survive. So in an effort not to get run over by the train, we're moving off the tracks 
into a position where we can either uh, disengage completely and then reset the fight, um, or we can move aside, or potentially you can hop above um, if you're like a hunter. Uh, Warlocks have a little harder time, but if you're a hunter, you, that jump is instant, so you can instantly jump above the Titan, and then you would only do this if you're running a shotgun, so in our case for Rudolfric, we would float to the side, take out a shotgun, shotgun them as they pass by. Or if you're a hunter with a shotgun, uh, you have your shotgun ready, they're flying straight at you, you you know, bones of EO double jump into the air, and you shotgun straight down on top of them. And then the juggernaut shield is completely nullified because it doesn't go up. It only goes forward. So if you take away their, that ability for that juggernaut shield to be useful at all, then you'll win. And you'll potentially turn a 595 into a 50-50 or a 60-40. Uh, or 70-30, or, you know, you turn into a 95-5 because you just outplay your opponent all the time. And if that's what your skill level is at, like, if you have a lot of Juggernaut Titans that abuse the shield and don't abuse the positioning that you gain out of it, then that straight jump straight into the air is going to catch them off guard so many times, they're not going to know how to deal with it because they're so used to getting away with so much um, because of how powerful Juggernaut Shield is. But it's not... It's not uh, something that's going to win you every single engagement. And it's not something that you can't counter, uh, even though you can abuse like the, the cooldown on the shield very easily, like how fast it recharges and how fast it comes back up. And you can just you know change your angle as soon as they float above you if they miss their shot, things like that. But it's not unbeatable, right? There are still things that you can do to get around it. I have a note that, you know, he just pushed into the golden gun. Not a big deal. This engagement, actually, I thought was really good. Um, we did have, the, and, and this is the, the final point that I want to make for today's episode. And that's having the right weapon out for the right engagement space that you're in. Or the right movement that you're doing. You can have the wrong weapon and the right movement. Or you can have the right move, uh, the wrong movement and the right weapon. Uh, but... There are different situations that you want to put yourself in based on and how you want to move based on what weapon you have out or what weapon you want to use to engage your target. Uh, in the case of pushing, if you run a shotgun and you push, if they're already in that 8 to 23 meter range on your radar, they're in the big pie slice, and you push them and you can't see them, you normally want to have your shotgun out because by the time you do see them, they'll probably be a lot closer than that initial 23 meters. If they're on the edge of the radar... So they're at that 23 to 31 meter range. You want to have your primary out. And you don't necessarily want to push into them. You want to push up or push around. You don't want to push in. Because if you push in and you have your primary out, then they just counter shock on you. So the maneuvers that you would make that are correct when you want to push through the primary are up, like floating, just like baiting, or around. So you come up and out, not up and in. So you wouldn't jump at your target. You jump sort of at a diagonal towards your target. Because you still want to create space. As soon as you start moving towards your target, you shorten the space. And that if you shorten the space, you put yourself into shotgun range. Because uh, if you go halfway, right, you're still outside of range, your opponent is going to fill that extra half. So it take, you know, if you're both moving together at the same time, you have even less time to react to if they push you with a shotgun. Now, if you have a shotgun and you're here and you can't see them, you're halfway, and then you're there here, and when you push, if you have that shotgun out, this push is safe. Because if they push into you, you shotgun them. But if they push away, then you, all you do, because you can't see them, you're still under cover. So you can just dip into cover if they do finally see you and you have your shotgun out. Then you could reset the engagement. So again, his drug shield came right up. And he was pushing into his target with his primary. The problem, with, again, the problem with pushing Titans is that they can very easily close that gap very quickly. And that's exactly what happened. Um, it, even if he didn't have the Jug Shield, he still needed a, a final shot on his target. This engagement here, I want to point out that um, just as a refresher, or to those that are new to the show, 
um, there's an acronym that I talk about called your ABCs. So that stands for always be checking. You always want to check when your abilities are coming up and you always want to check how much ammo you have and you always want to check what's going on in your radar. Um, so that's only a quick, quick glance or you got to count or, or listen to how many shots you fire. Um, hand cans, it's really easy. Uh, if you've done something like the last word, you can just kind of, you know, bounce the beat of the last word. You can mentally keep track of how many shots you have. Um, or you can just check. You can glance down in the corner there and you can see how many shots you have left. Um, same thing with your abilities. You can, pre uh, can perform different maneuvers based on which abilities are up. So if you have a super up, you can normally um, run through cover straight into like a uh, depending on the super, like so let's, let's say in this instance we have um, uh, Fist of Havoc up. If I have Fist of Havoc up, I know that if I push through cover into shotgun range, I'm going to kill my target because uh, as long as I don't get seen and get any shots on me, I have a free kill with that super. Um, same thing with uh, if I use uh, like Death from Above. If I can get above my target uh, into um, that 8 to 23 meter range based on my height and then angle, I'm normally going to be able to kill my target very easily. I can't do that um, with my personal play style because I'm either using hand cannon sniper or pull sidearm. So if I'm using one or something with a fusion, if I'm using one of those loadouts, I can't just push into my opponent because I'm going to get shotgunned all the time. So if I have a, a super up, then I can make that push. Um, in the case of the warlock, like our hero Rodolfric, when you have Thunderstrike up, you can push pretty aggressively into players and then back off immediately. Or when you go for a shotgun shot like this, if you follow up melee, when you get them to almost no shield, then you're going to kill them with that melee. If he had followed up melee there instead of trying to finish them with primary, he would have killed them. He was within that melee range. I don't, And I don't know if that's a, a mistake on the fact that he didn't know he had melee up. Or if he just forgot to melee. I don't know. But I'm going to assume that he didn't know what melee was up because we saw him earlier shotgun melee. So uh, keep in mind, like, know what you're capable of doing by just glancing and checking at what's going on um, with your HUD, what's going on with your abilities, what's going on with your timers. Uh, resource management is really important. It's important that even though in this particular engagement um, your target ran away, uh, I have in big caps on my notes, do not reload mid-engagement. Uh, especially with a hand cannon like an IS Luna or a palindrome, you have a lot of shots in your gun. And habitual reloading uh, could potentially take away double kills from you, could potentially take away... Um, you winning a 1v1, you getting flanked all of a sudden mid-animation. Mid so your target ran away, and you still have five in the chamber. Um, and I know he's not running luck in the chamber on his gun, because I didn't hear it any time during, uh, during this review. So because I know he's not running luck in the chamber, you have no reason to reload your gun here. Um, his primary shot is very solid. Like He doesn't miss very many shots, and he almost always engages within his effective range. So... With those two things in mind, you have enough shots, and you even have some leeway on your next target, right? You can miss two shots and still kill them. Or you have enough shots to just straight up four bodies. You don't have to reload your weapon there, especially if that person hid, and then during that reload engagement they re-engaged you, then they're going to have the opportunity to get two shots off on you before you finish reloading, and then you have to hit a shot. And by that point they could potentially, especially if they're a warlock, they could potentially be regening their health. And then it's too late for you. Then you're way far behind in the health game. And if that guy had been any quicker flanking like that, then he would have, again, been dead. Um, another little nitpick that I wanted to point out is something that has to do with uh, spike grenades. So spike grenade, lightning grenade, trip mine. I see this all the time from a lot of players of all skill levels. If there is one of those three grenades in front of you, do not walk through it. 
Do not stand still and wait for it to run out. You take out your primary, you aim at the spike grenade, and you shoot it, and then you break it. Uh, the reason you do that is because you don't want to outplay a grenade, right? You don't, if you can just get rid of it very easily. And also, in this case is Rumble, but if you're playing a team mode and you see one of those grenades and you don't shoot it, and someone doesn't pay attention, and they walk into it, and they die because of it, that's on you. That's not on them. Because you had every opportunity to save them from that. Not everybody's going to have perfect map awareness. But if you see a grenade, and it's going off, and it's right in front of you, uh, you don't want to just sit there and wait for it, because that puts you out of position. Uh, but you also don't want to just, uh, just stare at it and... Or you don't want to just try to go around it. Because that's the whole point of the grenade. The whole point of the grenade is to deny area. And they want... A good uh, area denial grenade will funnel you into a location where the opponent knows where you're going to go. So, uh, here's an example. We're playing on Burning Shrine. And you're on uh, Seaside Bridge. So, if we're looking at the map, straight into the map, right? Heavy's back here. And we're on. you're on Seaside, so you're on the right. I throw a lightning grenade onto C, C table, which is the center area between C flag and C, um, and C shelf. So it's on C table, and it hits you once. What do you do, right? You go one of two ways. You either go to C flag or you go to C shelf. Well, depending on where I threw that grenade, I know exactly where you're going to go to. Even if you sit still uh, it, and you... Uh, and you break the grenade, I know that you're only going to go one of those two places. So I can immediately get an angle on one of those places, and I can get my teammates to flank around and go get the angle on the other one. So eventually, uh, essentially pincering you. Now, what if it doesn't hit you, and it's right in front of you? Let's say you're on sea shelf, and I lock off sea table, right? We just spawned, I ran over there, I threw that grenade, this is trials, I threw that grenade, um, uh, on to, to cut off the, the path that comes onto C bridge. And I'm on A bridge. And I cut off your path. And you don't no, no damage has been taken and it's pulsed twice now. So it's got two more pulses. Uh, I know that if that grenade is pulsed twice, you have not gone through it to go to C flag. I know that. So I no longer need to look at C, C table anymore. I can just go into B and look at where you're at in C flag. Or in, in C shelf. I know exactly where you're at. Based on the fact that you took no damage and my lightning grenade is still going off. So by breaking that grenade, you break my ability to accurately predict what you're doing. And you break my ability to flank you. That's why you break those grenades. That's the primary reason why you break those grenades. Because once you play against better and better players, they know exactly what you're going to do if you leave that grenade up because it limits your options. You want to keep your options open, and taking an extra second to fire on a grenade and break it gives you those options back, right? Then the game is back in your hands. All right, so I mean that, we're gonna continue watching uh, the video, but that kind of encompasses what I wanted to cover um, this time, I'm just gonna kind of point out some more little mistakes that Rodolphic makes for the rest of this, but for the most part, that's kind of the bulk of what I wanted to talk about. So we're gonna see, he, again, he's keeping that range, he's keeping that distance, which is really good. And he's playing, again, patient play. He's keeping, he's never really pushing into players. Now, this just shows me that he's either an uncomfortable in extreme close quarters, which is okay, because you, you notice he's never in like, super far again he tries to outplay the grenade here and if his opponent hadn't chased after the guy that went in the back of the corner then he would have been dead and if he wasn't running max recovery here uh then he would have been dead to the player he engaged to if his, if the player he engaged hit a headshot instead of two body shots on him he would have been dead so it's okay to, to wait and break that grenade and not don't try to outplay it because that's going to result in you getting more wins than it is you just completely getting bodied rounding a corner because you're absolute. Um, other little things. 
When you're a Storm Warlock, you don't want to blink into players. It's very dangerous because uh, if they're running Nova Bomb, if they're running Smash, if they're running Hammers and Sun Charge, uh, you want to be able to blink through those, you want to be able to blink past those, you want to be able to bait them out by blinking backwards. By blinking into players, you give your opponent the opportunity to shut you down. And the, the range of your, uh, of your zap is really far. Um, you don't have to be very close uh, to zap your opponent. Um, the other important thing is, and why we don't blink into players when we super, is because of close and or personal on shotguns. Now, a shotgun melee can kill you, but they have to hit um, a bunch of pellets to the head. It's really hard. But close and or personal charges, um, your uncharged melee, and a bunch of other melees that um, I won't really go into. If you want to look at the research, you can. The most important one to keep in mind is uh, it charges. if it charges Stormfist, it goes from 156 damage to like 197. So they only need to hit like, I want to say six pellets out of like the 13 that fire out of your Matador um, and then melee you to kill you out of your super. Um, it becomes very easy to kill you if they run close and or personal. So you want to take that away from your opponent. You want to take away the ability for them to shut you down. The way you do that is you don't put yourself in that range to begin with. So don't blink into players. Blink around them. Blink straight up. Blink backwards. And just kind of float into them. Um, the only time you want to blink into someone is if they're a sniper and you're blinking through the sniper lane. Because you know they're not going to... They're probably... or I, I'd say you know they're not going to kill you. But they're probably not going to kill you with their sniper if you just blink into them. Um, some snipers... Um, especially if they heed my advice of taking shots, they will sometimes get very lucky and like quick scope you or no scope you or just line up a good shot and hit you with it. Um, but most of the time, you're pretty safe blinking into snipers. So again, patient play is all about knowing when to push. And he, because we know that lots of players go through that bridge area, um, it's normally unsafe to push that. That engagement there, um, you missed just one pellet. If you hit hit one more pellet, that melee would have would have killed them. And then the second follow up melee. If you try to do a second follow up melee, you have to be pushing into your opponent. You need to be because if they backpedal at any point, especially after your uh, your your thunder strike is out, then you know that's gonna happen. It's gonna whiff. Um. Oh, yeah, Katie. So, again, we're not pushing onto the bridge. It's very dangerous via crossfire. Very smart play. Here, we pushed into your opponent, and we realize almost too late hey, well, I'm going to be in shotgun range now. So, mm. takes out a shotgun. Right weapon. You know, it's questionable movement, but he had the right weapon for what for the situation. Same same thing there. Um, he didn't really push into uh, into the player to go get a kill. Like I would have liked to see him be a little bit more aggressive and more decisive about some of these shotgun battles. Um, you know, sometimes you do have to just warrior people because it's more effective that way. Here, as soon as I miss two shots, he, he takes a third shot. Um, as soon as I miss two shots, and sometimes as soon as I miss one, if my opponent has really good aim, I'm disengaging right away. Um, a good thing to keep in mind as you play and as you improve is, um, as you get better at this game, you tend to play against players that are also better at this game. So what does that mean for you as a player? That means that you're both missing less shots. Better players miss less shots. Better players make better decisions. Um, if you're gonna, if you're plateaued and you, you know, you're fine, you're you're at a 1.0 all the time, and when you were, you know, maybe at a 1.5 or at a 2.0 KD before. That's because these situations that we just saw there, where we missed a couple shots and then and we missed three full shots and then t pulled in the cover, a good player would have hit the three shots that you just missed and you would be dead. So if you miss one shot, if you miss two shots, that's when you need to immediately disengage. You don't want to try to continue to force an engagement. Um, you don't, 
you don't normally want to force any engagement um, because uh, unless you have a shotgun. Like shotguns are there for forcing engagements. You push through cover, you get into shotgun range, you force a kill. With primaries, primaries are very different. Primaries, you force positional uh, errors. You punish positional errors. Or you um, reward your own positional positional victories. As you move through cover, if you utilize your radar well and you, you know have a lot of map knowledge, then you can put yourself in a position where your primary is effective. But you don't force those um, situations. Normally, primary battles are mistakes of, uh, of position of your opponents. So here... That's a good example of having right movement, right? He's pushing into getting an engagement, but wrong weapon. Because by the time he he ended up sliding into someone, when if he had a shotgun out there when he slid, that would have been a kill. Again, try and you see the quick the the quick change. He knows what his opponent is gonna do. Um, or he thinks he knows what his opponent is gonna do. Um, or he puts himself in his opponent's shoes saying, hmm, if I just got someone uh, absolute, I would probably push them. So he has the right weapon out for what he thinks his opponent was going to do. Like that is a really subtle thing that most players won't pick up on um, as, as you review your own gameplay or even as you watch this. But he knew uh, how to defend himself when he was absolute. As a shotgunner, that's one of the most important things you need to know is when you're losing a gunfight, how to still be... Um, uh, be dangerous. You want to always be dangerous as a player. Shotguns make it very easy to always be dangerous as a player because they're always one shot in close range. And what do you do when someone's absolute? Well, your normal inclination is to push into them to try to finish them off. And that could potentially put you into an engagement where um, you get into that shotgun range. So... This engagement, the prime, the two engagements that happen here, but specifically this primary one, I want to point out. So that that engagement there, it's important to note that he it started as a primary fight, right? It started as a primary fight, and his opponent dipped into cover, and he started pushing. So he knows when he pushes, oh, you know, I know exactly where he is, and I'm pushing into one hit range. So I need to be ready for pushing into one hit range, and he switches to a shotgun. If he didn't switch to his shotgun here, he could have potentially, you know, missed that initial primary shot, even if he didn't fall at melee, and died to a, an enemy shotgun or pushing around that corner, absolute. So that is a perfect example, as well as this next example, of having the right weapon out for the right movement. So here, he sees his target and he's floating backwards. So he takes off his shotgun because he's floating away from his target. And he puts shots on his target with his primary. And as he pushes back forward, he takes back out his shotgun. Now, I would have liked to see him go to the right of the stairs instead of the left of the pillar like he did. Because he could have potentially been a lot healthier for the guy that shot him in the back. And maybe even potentially turn that into a win. But again, right movement, right weapon. That's what we want to be aiming for. And again, more subtle things, backpedaling while he's primary. All that good stuff. Now, unfortunately, I mean, time runs out, so he ends up losing the match. But this was a very winnable match if we just clean up those little mistakes we were making. And our KD for Rumble, this is pretty high. Pretty high KD. Um, so, as far as games go, this was a very good game for Rudolf Rick. But all those little mistakes basically compounded into a loss because, um, you know, sometimes, as you can see, all it takes is dying once instead of getting that kill, and that could potentially lose you the match. Uh, so no, no map knowledge on uh, floating gardens today. If I've done a couple of map, uh, stuff, a couple showings of floating gardens before, um, Check out some of those older episodes if you want more map knowledge stuff on Floating Gardens. Um, I've been on kind of a hiatus lately. Um, the winter months are kind of rough on me, uh, personally. So, I apologize. Um, I'll be back with a more... Um, I'll be back with a more steady schedule. Um, business as usual, you know, 
the whole two episodes a week and back to doing those two minute drills for you guys um but yeah that's the episode for today uh as always i really appreciate everyone that watches all the support you guys uh provide me both financially and emotionally um everyone that says they like the show and they want me to keep going that does a lot for me so um if you ever want to help me out then send me a message that says hey i really like your content thanks for doing it that means a lot to me um monetarily all the money that you guys have been donating to me through the patreon that all goes to funding my wedding so not only do i appreciate that but um Kualet appreciates that um we're very excited it's only only a handful of months away before it happens, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. Um, that's the episode. Uh, if you want, again, if you want to support the stream, you can always become a Patreon backer. Um, I have reward tiers for personal tutoring, um, game nights, giveaways, things like that. Um, if not, you know, if you watch this on YouTube, you can always sub to the channel, see the new videos that I put out, do the two minute drills, all that good stuff. Um, I've been your host, King Koala. This has been Crucible Bootcamp. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Class is dismissed.